Well, I had a couple of senior moments this morning. I hate to admit it. I, uh, I don't even like to admit that I'm a senior. I keep getting this stuff in the mail, you know, about Medicare and everything, and because uh, I turned 65 in November. And so I don't know whether I like that or not. I don't even know what to do with it. But uh, anyway, um, one senior moment I had is I forgot to go out and talk to the kids out in the clubhouse. So Charlotte came in to get me where you at, you know. I said, well, I'm sorry, I forgot. So I'm having a hard time remembering what we're not supposed to do, you know. So anyway, the other senior moment I had is I forgot to introduce a very, very special guest today. Never been here before. Here for the first time. And it's a baby. Baby Remy Grace is with us this morning. Isn't that great? So, um, she was uh, born premature. What was a year? How long ago? How many months ago now? A year old. Okay. And and when she was born, it was at one pound eight ounces. Is that right? One pound eight ounces. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that a miracle? So she's a miracle baby. So she can cry all she wants to during the service, okay? So my niece had a baby uh, recently and uh, is in the NICU in uh, Kansas City. And she's, I think, three pounds something. Is that right? So about a month and a half early. So she's doing well, though. So we appreciate your prayers for her. But it's such a wonderful blessing to have, have this baby with us today. And we've, of course, many of us been in prayer for her and her family uh, a year ago when all this started out, and isn't that amazing that she's with us today for the first time. So, Well, we're going to start a series through some of the judges of Israel. How many of you before today ever heard of the name Othniel? You ever heard of Othniel? I have to admit, I'd, sir, I've read it, but I didn't pay much attention probably. And so we're going to talk about Othniel today. Uh, this is something I've never done before, looking at the judges, and so... Um, when I began to look at this, I uh, found out that there were 12 uh, judges that are listed in the book of Judges. And so most scholars believe that there was one judge from each tribe. We're not told about some of the tribes that they came from. But many scholars think that the Lord chose one from every single tribe. They, they served in succession, so they didn't serve at the same time. This, of course, was before the, the king came along, King Saul. And... Um, there's only six that we really know much of anything about. Six of them, we have their name and how long they serve, but that's about it. Just a verse or two of information about them. And so not a whole lot of preaching material there. But there are six of them that have uh, some significant things about them that are mentioned in Scripture that we're going to look at over the next eight weeks. So there's six of them. And I went ahead and threw in uh, Eli and Samuel. And you may say, well, they're not judges, but they did lead Israel. And, of course, they served as priests. And so uh, many would, would count them as, as judges, as ruling over the, the nation of Israel. And so we're going to look at them as well. So that will give us eight sessions. And so this will take us all the way through the end of July. And so we're going to start this morning with this man called Othniel. The judges um, settled disputes among the people. They would decide legal issues and stuff, kind of like judges do today. But when you think about the judges of Israel, they were primarily military leaders, almost like generals, that would lead Israel against their enemies. And so that was their primary role, even though they're called judges. But they did judge when Odebra sat under a tree, a certain particular tree, and, and made judgments. And so they fought against Israel's enemies. And so that's the primary role that they would fulfill. Three places in the book of Judges we have this phrase at the top of your outline. It says, In those days Israel had no king, Everyone did as he saw fit. Underline that part. Everybody did as he saw fit. Well, that'll get you into all kind of trouble, won't it? When there is no authority, when there is no one really to, to say, this is what you need to do, this is what you're supposed to do. If there's no one to hold you accountable, then there's going to be problems, there's going to be chaos and anarchy. I cannot believe that we actually have some city leaders in our country today that apparently are seriously considering defunding the police. Do you believe that? I mean, what nonsense is that? That's the most asinine thing i ever heard of in my life. How can you not have authority in your community? We don't have authority in our community. We're just going to have complete chaos. 
And so that's kind of what it was like. And so the Lord would bring up, raise up these judges and they would serve one after another. And so they fulfilled that role of giving guidance and authority over Israel and serving as judges. And so this, of course, was before King Saul came along. And this was necessary because Israel continued to go through a cycle of rebellion. So we're going to take a quick look at this cycle of rebellion that Israel went through. And it's mentioned for us here in, in Judges chapter 3, beginning at verse 7. And so that's where we're going to be looking this morning. But there's this cycle of, of rebellion uh, against the Lord and against His will that Israel did again and again and again. Okay? So let's take a look at this. Uh, the first part of the cycle was that Israel would rebel against, the God, against God. They would turn their back against the Lord and get into the worship of false gods and idolatry. In verse 7, it says the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and it says they forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asherahs. Now, Baal was a Canaanite god, and Asherah was a female goddess. And so when Israel came into the land, of course, the Lord warned them that, that they were in, in danger of getting involved in the worship of idols and the false gods that the people that lived there were doing. And so that's why they were supposed to run all of them out of the, the area of Israel, and they didn't get that done. And so they had this snare that was against them, and they kept getting into the worship of false gods. Uh, there's a word called syncretism, where you kind of begin to uh, you know, adopt the, the culture around you and the practices around you. Uh, we, get in, we have all kinds of, of you know, traditions that we observe, like Christmas and Christmas trees and Halloween and things like that. That's a part of syncretism that you know, came from other parts of the world. And it was a part of our culture because there were groups of people that began to practice that, and it became kind of a habit and began to spread, and then just about everybody observes it. And so they were really getting involved into the worship of these false gods and idolatry. But notice that part there where it says that they forgot the Lord their God. And that's, that's something that all of us have to struggle with all the time, isn't it, as believers in the Lord. I know that you love the Lord with all your heart, but it's very, very easy for us to be distracted by our surroundings, very, very easy for us to, to be drawn away from the Lord and our faithfulness to the Lord from time to time. I know all of us have been there. I've certainly been there. And so it's, just, it's a difficult thing sometimes to not adopt the, the culture around you, to get distracted by the things that other people are involved in to the point where you kind of neglect your relationship with the Lord. And you can easily fall out of fellowship with the Lord. Um, now I want to make it clear, of course, once you become a Christian... You can never, ever lose that relationship. It's, it's a done deal. And you're saved forever from the penalty of your sins. You never need to ask God to save you again and again and again. You get saved one time. And once you're saved, you don't have to worry about that. Nothing you do, no mistake you made, no sin you commit, nothing like that is going to prevent you from going to heaven. You're secure in your relationship with Christ. Aren't you glad for that? But we still sin, don't we? Christians still get involved in sin. From time to time, we fall out of fellowship with the Lord. Uh, we're led astray, perhaps, by what others are doing, or we get distracted. We have other interests that begin to demand our time. And we, all of us, from time to time, struggle with this very thing of forgetting the Lord, of neglecting the Lord. And so that's what happened to Israel. They rebelled against the Lord. They got involved in the idol worship and idolatry and false worship that was around them. The second thing that happens here in this cycle is that God would discipline them. Look at verse 8. It says, The anger of the Lord burned against Israel so that he sold them into the hands of Cushon Rishatham. And so he was a leader in the northern area of Syria today. That's up north, up toward the Euphrates River and the Tigris River. In fact, that place where this was at was called the place between two rivers. And so it's pretty far north of Israel. But Israel became very, very vulnerable because of their weakness. And so the Lord allowed this enemy to come against them and to conquer them. And so the Lord disciplined them because of their rejection of him. They're turning their back on him and failing to continue to worship him, as of course they should have. And so this really is a picture of what happens to us as well, isn't it? That sometimes uh, the Lord 
disciplines us, even as believers, even as Christians. Now, some people don't believe that. Do you think God ever gets angry at Christians? He's been, he's been angry with me, I have no doubt. So, the Lord loves us. He is our Heavenly Father. And just like any earthly father or earthly mother will discipline their kids when they get out of line, God loves us too much to not discipline us, doesn't he? And so it has nothing to do with our eternal security. You know, our position in Christ is always secure, but we have this family relationship, this, this fellowship, I like to say, with the Lord. And certainly Christians can fall out of fellowship with God. And when that happens, and if we continue in that long enough, God loves us too much to allow us to continue to do that. So God will discipline us. Sometimes, uh, I like to say, he kind of gives us a spiritual whipping, doesn't he? Uh, God can use circumstances. He can use people. He can do anything he chooses to do to bring us back where we need to be in our fellowship with him, in our walk with him. So we never run the risk of losing our relationship with God, but we can certainly fall out of fellowship with God. And so God was angry about what the Israelites had done and their idolatry, and so he began to discipline them. He allowed their enemies to come against them. And so in this instance, God just kind of took his hand off of Israel and allowed this enemy to come and to cause them all kinds of problems. I think that God takes his hand off of nations, doesn't he? He did here. God can take his hand off of a person and allow that person to go their own way. And so if you make a decision, a choice, to kind of turn your back on God and and just go your own way, God will let you do that, of course, but there's a price to pay. There are consequences for doing that. So, Israel rebelled, God brought discipline. And then number three, Israel would repent. It says here in verse 9 that they cried out to the Lord. And they began to cry out and pray and say, Oh God, please help us, please deliver us. Our enemy is going to defeat us and is oppressing us. And please come to our rescue. And so Israel would repent of the sin that they had committed. They'd turn away from what they had been doing that was wrong, and they would cry out to the Lord. And usually, of course, it would happen because of some kind of a crisis. Don't we do the same thing? We stray away from the Lord sometimes, and um, the Lord allows us to go through a time of difficulty, a time of struggle, a time of oppression, some kind of a crisis of some kind. And sometimes that brings us back to the Lord, doesn't it? We cry out to the Lord. We ask the Lord to help us in our time of need. And so I think this is a, a very good picture of what happens to us as children of the Lord. The same thing that happened to the nation of Israel is what we go through as believers. And then the fourth thing here in this cycle of rebellion is that God would send a deliverer. That's when he would raise up a judge to deliver them. God raised them up a deliverer in verse 9. So he would rescue them. He would deliver them from their oppression, uh, from this enemy that had come against them because God allowed the enemy to come. And so God delivers us all the time, doesn't he? Wouldn't it be great if we could break that cycle? If we could just remain faithful to the Lord all the time? Now, we're going to have ups and downs, of course, in our walk with the Lord. That's inevitable. But wouldn't it be wonderful if for the most part... If for the most part we stayed faithful to the Lord almost all the time. That we were always reading our Bibles or always spending time in prayer with the Lord. Always seeking to fulfill God's will for our lives. Coming to church, worshiping the Lord, growing in our faith. Trying to witness to others and minister to other people in the name of the Lord. Wouldn't it be great if we could break this cycle that is a part of human nature? And we can with God's help, we can do that, can't we? And that's where Othniel comes in. As I studied this passage and tried to come up with an outline, this is what really spoke to my heart, how God used Othniel and his story to show us how God can strengthen us and prepare us for the difficult times that we're going to go through and for the temptations that we have to stray away from him and how God can work to keep us close to him most of the time if not all of the time, okay? So that's what speaks to my heart about this man called Othniel. And so we're going to see how we can break this cycle, the same type cycle of rebellion that Israel went through. The first thing that, that I can see here is that when God is trying to strengthen us and prepare us, He uses other people to inspire us. God uses other people to inspire us. 
Notice what happened here in verse 9. It says, When they, the Israelites, cried out to the Lord, He raised up for them a deliverer, Othniel, son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, who saved them. So you read through that, it's okay. Well, that just gives us a little bit of background about this, this guy named Othniel. When I read this, it just jumped out at me. Guess who his uncle is? His uncle is Caleb. Now, who was Caleb? You remember Caleb? Caleb was one of the 12 spies that Moses sent in to spy out the promised land. There was a, a, a spy or a, an explorer, you might say, from every single tribe. And Caleb was one of those. In fact, Caleb was only one of two of the spies that gave a positive report to the Israelites telling them that we can go in and we can take this land. Remember that? They all agreed that it was a wonderful land. They went in and you remember how long they spied out the land? It was for 40 days. For 40 days they spied out the land. Then they came back and they brought some of the fruit with them. There's an area around this area we're going to talk about this morning where Caleb lived and where Othniel lived called Hebron, and in that area there, there are lush grapevines, even to this day, many, many grapevines. And there's a valley through there called Eshkol. Eshkol means cluster. And it's called that because two of these spies took a big old pole and a big old huge cluster of grapes, and they carried those grapes back from that area back to Moses to show him, say, look here what we found. It must have been huge, I mean just huge cluster of grapes. And that was just a sample of, the, of the, the fruitfulness of the land. And they said it really is a land flowing with milk and honey. You ever wonder what that means? I used to think as a kid, well, were there rivers of milk and stuff out there? And, you know, milk and honey. Milk probably refers to the lush green grassland and all of that that would feed the cows and then they would give milk. Honey is actual honey. The bees produced honey and it was just plentiful. And so those are wonderful things. Milk and honey is pretty good stuff, isn't it? You know, as a kid, I used to have butter and honey all the time, you know, on toast. It's good stuff, you know. So, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. And they said, it's great. But ten of the spies said, there's a problem. There's these huge, huge men that live there. And there is no way we can go in there and take this land. They're just too powerful. Not only are these huge men that make us look like grasshoppers, there are also all these enemies, and they have fortified cities, and they have walls around their cities and all that, and there's just no way, there's no way that we can go in there and take the land. Now keep in mind, they had already seen the Lord work ten miracles, ten miracles, when He delivered them out of Egypt. Remember that? And so they, they really had a display of incredible lack of faith, unfaithfulness before the Lord. And so I'm sure you remember the story. The Lord said, because you... You folks are afraid to go in. They cried out and said, oh, we can't do this. And they even decided, well, maybe we need to pick us another leader and go back to Egypt. They were going to give up and go back to Egypt. And there were only two spies that said, no, we need to go in and we need to take the land. That was Caleb and the other was Joshua, right? And so the Lord said, okay, because you've done this, every single one of you people are going to die in the wilderness. And the only two that are going to get to go in are Joshua and Caleb that are here right now and all the descendants of these people. And so, you know, they changed their mind then and said, well, well, we can go ahead and do it. But it didn't work out too well, did it? The Lord was not with them and they got defeated. And so the Lord said, you're going to wander for 40 years in the wilderness, one year for every single day that the spies scouted out the land. And that's exactly what happened. So, that's a long story to tell you about the man Caleb. Caleb was a man of tremendous faith. He also was a mighty warrior. He actually went in and defeated these giants that lived, these huge men that lived in the area of Hebron because that was the area that was given to him. The Lord gave him that area as an inheritance. And so he went in and he fought against these huge odds, these huge men and won a great victory. And so he's a great man of God. He's a great man of faith. He was a great warrior. And so this is Othniel's uncle. Now, do you think that that has anything at all to do with Othniel's faith? I really believe it does. Why else is it mentioned in Scripture? I think there's a reason for that. Caleb had a tremendous 
influence, I'm convinced, over Othniel. Did you know that, um, that Caleb told his men one time, he said, guys, there's this city just south of Hebron called Debir, Debir, and he said, if somebody will go in there and capture that city for us, I'm going to let him marry my daughter. Guess who that man was? Othniel. Othniel went in there and captured that city with his men, and he got to marry uh, Caleb's daughter. So I guess that means she was his cousin. I guess they were kissing cousins, right? So he got to, to marry this woman. So I have no doubt whatsoever that, that Caleb had a tremendous influence over Othniel. The name Othniel means God is my strength. Anytime you see L on the end of a word, it means God. And so Othniel means God is my strength. And so his name tells us that he was someone who was totally devoted to the Lord. And he had great faith in God. And God was using him in a mighty way and raised him up to be a judge among the Israelites. And so I think a big part of this, of course, is because God in his wisdom allowed Caleb to have such an influence on his nephew that he became a great leader of Israel. So our faith will influence those around us. Our faith, no doubt, will have a tremendous impact and influence on people around us. You know, sometimes, uh, most often, faith runs in families, doesn't it? It really does. Sometimes the, the actions that we have and the faith that we exhibit the Lord uses that in a powerful way to be a powerful impact on our kids, on our grandkids, on others that might know us or see us or have something to do with us. So that's an awesome responsibility, isn't it? Uh, I've heard Dr. Phil say, and it must be right, you know, Dr. Phil said that uh, the same sex parent is the biggest influence on a child, the same sex parent. And I would think the same-sex grandparent would have a pretty big influence as well, right? So that's an awesome responsibility that you have to be an influence over those who are under you. Your children, your grandchildren, anyone else that looks up to you or is inspired by you. And so faith runs in families. Remember what Paul said about Timothy? Timothy was his young understudy and a great servant of the Lord that followed in Paul's footsteps. Timothy uh, was commended by Paul for his great faith and he said he says I know it began first in your your grandmother Lois and then of course in your mother Eunice and now of course it's in you so his grandmother and his mother had a tremendous influence over him over Timothy in his faith in God and so think about that that's a big responsibility isn't it God uses the people in our lives to influence us to inspire us to motivate us to be more faithful and you may be thinking, well, gosh, you know, I kind of messed up. You know, I didn't do as well as I should have. It's never too late. It's never too late to have an influence. Even if those kids are now grown, you still can have a tremendous influence on them by your walk with the Lord. And so God uses those around us to inspire us to follow in his footsteps, to, to be the kind of men and women of God that the Lord would have us to be. Secondly, God fills us with his Holy Spirit. This is what happened to Othniel. Verse 10, it says, The Spirit of the Lord came upon him so that he became Israel's judge. And then, of course, he went to war. A lot of Old Testament scholars believe that the Holy Spirit didn't actually indwell the Old Testament saints, that he just kind of came upon them, that he didn't really indwell them until Christ, you know, of course, went to the cross and the day of Pentecost came and all that, the birthday of the church that we looked at last week. I don't know about that, but I do know that the Holy Spirit would come and go, come and go in the Old Testament times. And so there was a difference, of course, before Christ went to the cross. And so it says that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and empowered him and strengthened him so that he could be a judge of Israel. And so we know, of course, that the Holy Spirit empowers us in our walk with the Lord and strengthens us and helps us to accomplish all that God would have us to accomplish. I kind of did a little word study this, this past week on the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives, okay? And there was 10 things that I found here, and I didn't put them in your outline because there's so many, but there's 10, 10 things, 10 roles that the Holy Spirit plays 
in our life. And so if you want to jot these down quickly, I'll go through them. The first one is he baptizes us into the body of believers. We are all part of the body of Christ as Christians. And so the Holy Spirit baptizes us, which means he immerses us into the body of Christ, into the, the family of God. Secondly, he regenerates us. He regenerates us. Sometimes we use that term born again, as Jesus used when he talked to Nicodemus. We're regenerated. Our souls are regenerated by the Holy Spirit when we become a believer. Thirdly, he indwells us. He lives within us. He's always within us. He never leaves us as Christians. Fourthly, he gifts us. He gives us spiritual gifts. All Christians have at least one spiritual gift that God has given you that he wants you to use to strengthen the church. Some Christians have more than one. Number five, he teaches us. He teaches us. He instructs us. Number six, he guides us. Guides us in God's will and shows us what he would have us to do. Some folks have a big problem with the word conviction when it comes to a Christian. Some have said, well, Holy Spirit would never convict a Christian because it has to do with sin. But again, I think it gets back to this relationship and fellowship that we have with God that there's a difference between the two. We are convicted not to be saved, but we're convicted to do what God wants us to do, aren't we? And so I think that's a part of the Holy Spirit guiding us. He, he, he pricks our heart, the, the King James says. He, he convinces us and convicts us of the right things we should do and the wrong things that we shouldn't do, right? When I became a minister, there, there was a phrase that was very popular back then. I haven't heard it in a long time, but used to when a man felt called of God to go into the ministry, they'd say, he surrendered to the ministry. Remember that, Danny? He surrendered to the ministry. Uh, what in the world does that mean? Well, I found out what it means because I ran from that call for a long time. I was scared to death. And God con continued to convict me and to speak to my heart and to say, this is what I want you to do. And so I know full well what that term means, to surrender to the Lord's will. And it's because of the, the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. He convicts you to do what He wants you to do. Number seven, He fills us. Filling is different than indwelling. You get the indwelling of the Spirit when you get saved. But being filled with the Spirit is something different. It's when you're just, just overflowing with the Holy Spirit of God in your life and you're just excited about your relationship with the Lord and you're just, you just want to go out and serve the Lord and you want to tell people about Jesus and you want to get involved in ministry and all of that. That happens when you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Very similar to what happened here to Othniel when he had the Holy Spirit come upon him. Number eight, the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. He intercedes between us and our Heavenly Father. The Bible says that He, he expresses our, our feelings and our thoughts and our will to the Lord when it's hard for us to put it into words. The Holy Spirit does that for us. Number nine, He comforts us. You ever been comforted by the Holy Spirit during a time of trouble or turmoil? And number ten, He seals us. The Bible says He seals us until the day of redemption. And so we're, we're locked in in our relationship with God, and that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that amazing? And so the Holy Spirit of God indwells every single believer, and He fills us and empowers us to do God's will. So if you're ever afraid or you know, nervous about serving the Lord or stepping out on faith, just remember you're not doing it alone. You've got the Holy Spirit of God helping you and empowering you to do that. So the Holy Spirit empowers us. In Acts 1.8, you know, Jesus had instructed the, uh, the disciples to, to stay in Jerusalem you know, after his ascension back to the Father until the Holy Spirit would come. And then in Acts 1.8, he said, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And of course, that's what happened on the day of Pentecost. We talked about that last Sunday. The Greek word for power which is dunamis, is where we get our English word for dynamite. For dynamite. In other words, there's this explosive power of the Holy Spirit in your life uh, because of your relationship with God, because God has given you His Holy Spirit. And so there are things that you can do that you never thought you could do because of the fact that you have a relationship with God, that Jesus lives in your heart, and He empowers you to accomplish His will. That's what he did for these judges. And they were great heroes, weren't they? So we're going to be looking at them like Deborah and Samson, these guys that did amazing things. 
and had superhuman strength and those kinds of things. And so God came upon them in the power of the Holy Spirit and empowered them to do His will. In Acts 13.52, it says the disciples were continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. And so in the early days of the church, man, they were so excited to, to have a relationship with Jesus and they knew they were going to go to heaven. And so they were just always meeting together, the Bible says. They were excited to get together and to see one another and to fellowship with one another. And it says they were filled with joy and they were also filled with the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians 5.18, Paul, the Apostle Paul said, Be filled with the Spirit. Be filled. That's an imperative verb. It means it's a command. God instructs us, this is what I want you to do. And so there's something we can do that helps us to be filled with the Spirit. And you're doing that this morning. Coming to church, studying the Scriptures, praying, asking God to guide you and to empower you. When we get serious with the Lord and we totally surrender our lives to the Lord, He's going to empower us and strengthen us to do what He wants us to do. So there are things you can do you never thought you could do. Anything that God wants you to do that you're afraid of, God will give you the strength to do it, won't He? He wouldn't be pressuring you to do that. He wouldn't be guiding you to do that if He didn't give you the strength and power through His Holy Spirit to accomplish that, no matter what it is. And so I'm sure you could think some, of some examples in your life how God has used you and empowered you to do things you never thought were possible if you'll just step out in faith, just totally surrender to the Lord. So, the Holy Spirit came upon Othniel, and God used him to be a great leader of Israel and to help them fight against their enemy. So, God uses people to inspire us. God fills us with His Holy Spirit. And then thirdly, God gives us time to reflect on His deliverance. After God rescues us, He gives us some time to think about that. He gives us a time of peace, really, in our heart and our spirit to think about what He has done. Uh, in Judges 3.11, it says, So the land had peace for 40 years until Othniel, son of Kenez, died. So the 40 years that Othniel reigned as a judge, Israel had peace from their enemies. A 40-year period of time. And so they had plenty of time to think about this. And I think it's clear in Scripture here that God did this to show them that He was the one who was protecting them and shielding them during this time period to give them time to appreciate what He had done and also to give them time to react to what God would have them to react to, to be faithful to Him. The word 40, of course, is used many times in Scripture, the number 40. Um, Deborah and Gideon also served for a 40-year period of time. Uh, we're told that the priest Eli served for 40 years. The first three kings of Israel, Saul and David and Solomon, each served for 40 years. This, this term 40 is used some, oh gosh, 146 times in Scripture. And so the number 40, of course, is a very, very significant number, kind of like the number 7, which means a time of completion. The number 40 is very, very, uh, very, very significant, very unique. If you back up in Judges to chapter 2 and verse 18, notice what it says here. It says, Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was with them and the judge and saved them out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. So this happened for every single one of the judges. As long as they were alive, God gave them peace. But when the judge died, that's when they'd get into trouble again. That's when this cycle of unbelief would start up again. And so I think God was showing them if they would remain faithful to Him, if they would trust in Him, God would give them deliverance and this leader, as long as he was alive, they'd have peace. Doesn't mean that he had to fight for them all the time. It's just once they won their victory, they had peace until that, that man died or that woman died, Deborah. And so it says, The Lord had compassion on them as they groaned under those who oppressed and afflicted them. So the Lord gave them this, this period of time. In this case, with Othniel, it was a 40-year period of time. So the number 40 in Scripture refers to a time of, of probation or a time of testing. It's a testing time to see how people are going to respond, to see if people will appreciate what God has done for them, to see if people will remain faithful to the Lord. 
And of course, many times the Israelites did not do that. After their leader died, they would get into trouble again, right? I think that speaks to our hearts, doesn't it? God wants to see how you're going to react when He delivers you, when He rescues you. When you get into trouble, whether it's a sickness, a health problem, or a financial problem, or a relationship problem, whatever it is, you got trouble at work, when you get into real trouble, and you begin to pray to the Lord, and you ask God to deliver you, and He does, how are you going to react to that deliverance? How are you going to react to that, that rescue from the Lord? Is it going to do anything to you? Is it going to change your attitude at all? Are you now going to be more faithful to the Lord than you were before? Or are you going to drift back into this being out of fellowship with God once again? That's the question. That's what really spoke to my heart this week as I looked at this. I can't count the times where I've been in trouble or I've been afraid or I've been scared about something and I've prayed and I've asked God for help and God has delivered me again and again and again and again. I've got to where I tell the Lord when I pray to Him, say, Lord, I know I don't deserve it, but please have mercy on me anyhow. You've done it before, please do it again, Lord. Please have mercy on me. And so when you go through a time of, of crisis or you go through a time of turmoil and God blesses you, God rewards you, God strengthens you, He, he pulls you out of the fire, what are you going to do with that? Is it going to change you at all? Or are you just going to go back to doing what you were doing? Sometimes, unfortunately, Christians, once they're, once they're out of trouble, it doesn't take long before they turn their back on the Lord once again. Remember back during 9-11 years ago when the, the Twin Towers were attacked and all that and the Pentagon and we had all this destruction? You remember that day? I remember it very clearly. I was in Glorietta. Charlotte and I were at a a trustee meeting for Lifeway Christian Resources when these planes hit and I saw it on the television there in the lobby at Glorietta. We couldn't believe it. You know, we were shocked just like you were. Um, most of you, some of you too young to remember. But uh, I remember that day. We couldn't, uh, many of the people that were there had flown in from Albuquerque. They couldn't get out. They had to rent a bus. They had to charter a bus to get a lot of the, the people back to Nashville, the, the, the workers, the employees from Lifeway and everything. We drove because we were not that far away anyway, so we were able to get on back in our car. But I remember that first Sunday, that first Sunday after 9-11, you remember how the church was full? Churches across the country were full. They were packed. Christians just, just kind of woke up, you know, out of their apathy, and suddenly they all came to church, and the churches were all just full for one Sunday. The next Sunday, it was pretty much back to business as usual. To me, that's what this is saying. When God rescues you, when He delivers you, that ought to change you. That ought to serve as a catalyst in your heart to motivate you to want to serve the Lord and to be more faithful to Him and to not drift back into that spirit of apathy, right? That's what ought to happen. And so time and time again, the Lord rescued the Israelites. And as long as that judge was alive, they had peace and they could see that God was doing this. God is protecting us and rescuing us and, and holding us in His hand. And are we going to stay faithful? Or are we going to go right back to doing what we were doing before? And usually Israel went right back to doing what they were doing before. So don't let that happen to you. Did you know that the Italian word quarantine actually starts out as Latin and then French and then Italian? The Italian word quarantine literally means 40 days. Did you know that? Somebody put that on Facebook a while back, a few months ago, and I thought that can't be right, but it is. And somebody made a connection saying, well, now, it was 40 days from the time the, the stay-at-home order was given until it was lifted. And I don't know if that's true or not. Maybe. But the word quarantine means 40 days. That's what that means. 40 days. They'd have ships come in and they would quarantine a ship that had animals or people on it if there had been some kind of disease for a 40-day period of time to make sure that everybody was well before they would let them come off of that ship. And so the word quarantine literally means 40 days. Isn't that interesting? God uses that number so many times as a time of testing, a time of probation, to see if we're going to stay faithful to the Lord after He rescues us. Well, that's what this speaks to me. This man called Othniel. Uh, the strength of the Lord. The strength of the Lord being with him. 
Let's think about this this morning. God is using you somehow, some way to be an influence on somebody else. God is going to use your walk with the Lord to be an influence on your kids, your grandkids. In fact, you may be the most powerful Christian influence in somebody's life. And you may not even be aware of that. They're watching you. They notice what you do. And so that's a powerful thing. God fills us with His Holy Spirit as believers. If we'll get right with the Lord and walk with the Lord, He will fill us to overflowing so that we can accomplish everything that He wants us to accomplish as His children. And God is watching to see if what we go through is going to change us, if it's going to deliver us. How could it not change you? You know, Brother Danny and his wife went through a crisis you know, a couple of weeks ago. He called me on a Friday and said, well, I'm taking Linda to the hospital and she's having this terrible pain and nausea and all of that. And she had the gallbladder problem. Well, she went through three surgeries, had to go to Lubbock and have these gallstones removed from a duct in there. It's amazing. He's telling me all these things they had to do. She went through all this stuff and God delivered her from that. Now, you can't tell me that didn't change her and change Danny a little bit when they think about how God worked in her life. That's just one example. I bet every single one of you in here could give an example. What about Remy? What God did in Remy's life? And that, you think that family will ever be the same again? How could something like that happen to you and it not change you and draw you closer to the Lord? So you see how God can, can sometimes use a crisis and kind of shake us out of our apathy and remind us that He is there and He is powerful. He can overcome anything if we'll just trust in Him. You see how God does that? That's what this speaks to my heart. I hope it speaks to yours. Well, let's all stand and we're going to pray.